Okay, so today I'm just going to quickly explain how to get started with uh, Mask firmware. And to start with, let's have a look at the um, hardware we'll be using. We've got the usual CA120 CA KV motor with an F405 based IMS board target running on the power supply with 18 volts at the moment and 9 amps current I've got plugged into it, just a simple throttle. Um, I have some UART, we probably won't be using that today. Um, there we go. So, first thing we're going to want to do is to get hold of the repository. So we're going to say clone and source path URL we will go to the repository, copy the address, there we go, destination path, it's also completed, it's been masked firmware, so we hit clone. Um, using source tree you can do this however you want with your own git client, and hopefully in a second. We now have the firmware. So we have now got access to the master branch, <laughs> this one, various fixes. Um, and if we open it in the explorer, you can see we've got three projects because so far I've set up three different targets for the mask firmware. The F303 was the original board, 405 is like a VASC compatible board, and 401cc goes on to the black pill which was originally tested with um, Badgineer and Casano's um, cheap simple board so we can look into the 405 target today to find the dot project folder and double click it and it will load up in cube IDE if you haven't got the cube IDE just go to ST development tools da -da, get software it pops up in Google pretty easily get the software, get the windows or wherever you are, install it, get latest, that's it, done, and you get this. So now we should have the cube launcher, it wants to use default workspace, that's irrelevant to our situation now, and in any second now, it will load it. So it, it has some ghosts of the previous project because I, I cleared everything off my computer before starting this video. But this is the one we want, so we're just going to go into core, source, and open any of the files, and that gives us the option to use the build and the debug. So before we hit build or debug, we'll quickly go through how we set this up if you have your own board or whatever. So firstly, in the ink, there's the name of the board, .h and in this we have options to set all kinds of things like PWM frequency, has it got phase sensors, um, current polarities, settings and shunt values and yeah, all kinds, all kinds of different things. You can choose whether we use HFI or not. If I don't want to use HFI I just comment it out, but I probably do want to use HFI. Um, options for circle limiters, go through and look all these at your leisure. One of the more interesting ones is um, how you set your inputs. And here we have the option to have at the moment two ADCs, an RCPWM, and a UART input. Um, for today, we're just going to use the ADC, which will be that bit. So the others will work if they're present, but we're just using that bit. Um, so back to main, we just hit. There we go, I'm using a SEGA, so that is already set up, you can use STLink or SEGA, however you want. Hit go, it sits there, it compiles all the stuff, because we just cloned it, there's, there's no binaries yet. And, wait, wait, wait. It's flashed the chip, 
and we're ready to go. So we hit the play, and in the live expressions, we can add whatever we want. Um, for instance, if we look at the FOC variables here, we can see all the parameters that I use in the FOC. So it's got your I in the alpha beta frame, which has started. That's just some ADC noise because it's the board is set up for like 500 amps. Uh, I in the DQ frame, and then likewise VAB. You can see other things like the current power draw um, and the hertz. So if we turn the motor on and I flip across to the camera, so if we see. see it's currently doing HFI which runs all the way down to very very low speed you might be able to hear the screaming noise both from the baby and from the HFI on the motor and if we spin it up the HFI goes away there we go so that's how that works and that's it, essentially that is your mask set up and installed on a piece of otherwise VESC based hardware. Um, so if we wanted to, for instance, port this to another device or we wanted to add our own peripherals, we can use the QBIDE IOC generator um, and again, churny churny, it likes to take its time loading. And quickly talk through how the whole lot is set up start to finish. Um, so QBID gives you some of you will be well aware, some of you won't, it gives you this interface where you can see the outputs of the chip. Um, and you can edit things. So the standard pinout that people tend to use for an F405 MCU is that you use these ones for the current and voltages, uh, current and bus voltage. Uh, these pins are for phase sensing voltage. Um, these ADC options can get used for whatever you want, MOSFET temperatures or for um, throttle inputs, however. Uh, PB141513 and 1098, they are for the timer channels that generate the PWM and drive the motor. Um, up here, these SPIs I've been using to drive an encoder. Uh, this gives you RCPWM input on time one channel four. The, the interesting ones for us to look at at the moment are the um, ADCs and timers, because the critical things for making mask run are that you have timer one set up to generate three channels of PWM. Um, and the fourth channel we use for the ADC timing. Um, we also use the brake input, which goes to pin PB12, and when that gets pulled low, it instantly disables everything for a hardware overcurrent or over voltage event. Um, now, in the configuration, I've set it to be center aligned mode one. The counter period is set to 1023, but that doesn't actually matter because it gets rewritten. Uh, elsewhere in the firmware when you set the PWM frequency. We enable the brake polarity low, that means if it's pulled low it turns off. And then we set all the PWMs to mode 1, mode 1, mode 1, and they're normally set to 512. Again, that doesn't matter because they immediately get rewritten. Channel 4 is also PWM mode 1, um, but we don't actually assign that to a pin. It's generation no output. But what we do have is that that is used for the trigger event selection, which is set to OC4 ref. And yeah, that goes into each of the ADCs where we select in zero, which is uh, in there, and in five, which is here, and further down in 10, which is here. 
So in 10, 11, and 12 on ADC 1, 2, and 3 will give us our readings for current. ADC 3 in 13 gives us the bus voltage. And where these are set up is, we go further down here, ADC injected conversions. So there are three injected conversions on ADC 1. And injected rank 1 is channel 10, the current. So the first thing it does is it converts the current. We've got the time 1 trigger out event that we just discussed, which is triggered by PWM channel 4. And the, the detection is on the rising edge. So as the PWM goes up, it um, triggers the conversion. But PWM channel 4, we will always set to be dead in the center. Um, right, channel 2 is set up to be 0, so that's one of the phase voltages. And injected rank 3, channel 5, we've got that converting the, um, I think that's the throttle. I can't actually remember. We've got a similar thing for ADC 2 and ADC 3. In the injected conversions, we have, say, on ADC 3, channel 12, that is the C current in this case. The other thing we have to have is a timer 4, or you can actually use any time you want. We use this input capture direct mode in reset mode. So that gives you uh, an RCPWM throttle input, and we also set a counter period of 50,000. So if it overflows, we get this triggering at 20 hertz. Now the um, trigger event selection and the rising edge da, 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 da. and over in the NVIC settings we enable the time for global interrupt and likewise for the time one we enable the interrupt for the update. So if we wanted to generate code, we would hit this button here, and then we would get the code and we can go over to main. So what that does is that generates um, an interrupt.c file, and we have various things including the hard fault handler. If we hit a hard fault, we generate a break. Basically all of these fault handlers, we generate a break and it stops creating PWM. And when we get further down, this is the one we actually run, the timer 1 up, timer 10 IRQ handler. This is where the FOC enters through the MESC PWM IRQ handler. So when this interrupt is hit, which is once per PWM cycle, I toggle a pin so that I can watch an LED blink on and off, and then the IRQ handler fires. And we have a similar thing for the timer 4 IRQ handler. That enters there after toggling a different LED and we clear the interrupts. So inside that, we open the activation, the PWM IRQ handler, we check is it the top or bottom, um, and if it's at the top of the time account, we go to the fast loop, and if it's at the bottom, we go to what I've called the hyperloop. So the fast loop, investigate that, this is where it enters the FOC decision making, so we have switch for motor state if we're running then it'll enter are we using sensors or are we using senseless we're almost always using senseless these days runs the flux observer which is essentially the senseless observer and generates the angle then it goes to mask fock which does the pid controls and after that it writes the pwm at which point it breaks and exits until it, the interrupt is next hit um, now if we want to let's take a look at what actually happens to the variables because that happens first as soon as you enter the fast loop you get to the ADC conversion and in that this is the magic function that maps your hardware get raw ADC so this is within the F405 project whereas the others are in um, the MESC common project and here we map the um, injected ADC functions into measurement buffers or ADC. And this this is like the starting point for MESC to pick up um, basically the raw readings that you've got from the hardware. So you map these and this is where we map currents, throttles and phase voltages for later use. 
um, after we've got the raw ADC, we open the VI check, and that sits there and just checks, does the raw ADC exceed current limit values or voltage limit values? And if it does, then it's going to error and generate a break. So that will save your hardware in the event of yeah, aggressive overcurrent over voltage situations. Um, now, for the more advanced functions like the HFI, when we're in the IRQ handler at bottom, we open the hyperloop. So in that, if we use HFI, and the state is currently that we're injecting voltage, it sits there and it adds VD and VQ terms. Da da da, and then does some math to determine the extra angle, which we'll go into perhaps another day, and then we write the PWM values, and this does the space vector modulation, inverse Clark and Park transforms. Um, where else to go? Yes, the slow loop. So within askfoc.c, the slow loop is run off the. Um, actually, we, we can enter it here. Mask slow IRQ handler, we open the declaration, we do some logic checks for what time of flags we've got, and then we enter the slow loop, which is right here. Um, so we say if we're not measuring, that requires special functions, we will look at the input options, we collect our RCPWM, we collect our ADC1, um, that, these all go into their own buffers, ADC one IDQ rec um, then we fall out the bottom of that we clamp the overall request and add up IDQ rec is what actually gets fed into the FOC loop and so we, we clamp the request to be within um, within variables that we've allowed um, within our setup file Calculate the voltage gain. This is something that happens once per PWM cycle and accounts for varying bus voltage. Um, changes the gain parameters on the clock loop and various things. Um, we then enter, well, we calculate current power, which you can see in the um, debug menu. We choose things like do we use MTPA? Uh, we limit the amount of power we take from the battery. And then here we set whether we are tracking the motor using the phase sensors or if we're in um, actual like PWM driving, depending on the um, IDQ requested input. Um, a few other things, here we set and reset the HFI, which is currently crudely set so that if it's more than two volts on the VDQ, it's not running HFI, if it's below 2 volts it will be with a, a hysteresis band to stop it from rapidly switching in and out. Um, and then some logic here for injecting very high currents to disambiguate the HFI. Probably ought to set that as a configurable. Um, and there we go. Um, so not really much more to say. Let's have a look at some of the variables as we as we run. Hit 50. So now we're ready to play again. If we look over to the live expressions, you can see things like voltpairs.ehertz. And as we start the motor, it comes out of the tracking phase and HFI runs. You can see the hertz start to climb. And then when we, if we spin it up to max and we let off the throttle, it goes back to tracking. Um, so if we want to do things like, let's say we want to do a measurement, if we look into maskfoc.c, and we go back to here, we can set motor state measuring. And first we, we have to pause it, change the state to measuring within our debug register, and we hit 
play. But first, I'm going to go over to camera and we can see. Okay. Motor locks itself, does a bit of squeaking. And that's the motor parameters are now 5.45 blah blah milliohms, 4.71 L phase, the quadrature inductance 7.22, and it's got an LQD difference um, which it is going to use for the MTPA. Um, if we look into the defaults. When it started out, it was at these values. So it's clearly updated them. Um, these values are the ones I just guessed. Now, other features we've got is within the motor. The motor flux, it holds it at the, um, this is a default that it generates double that, but it actually tracks the flux in real time. So if I just spin the motor up, you can see it actually sits there and stabilizes at this 0 0.0039, 0.004 kind of value. So it's fairly uncritical what you actually set there, as long as it's within about a factor of two. Um, there are other possibilities. Uh, if you have hall sensors, you can set this to motor state uh, detecting, and it will sit there and find your hall sensors, which it then drops into the, um, I think it's in the Focvers dot hall table, but this motor I've got doesn't actually have any hall sensors, so everything defaults to zero, and it defaults to sensorless. Um, Anyway, that's kind of about it. It's really quite easy to set up. You just change the variables in there, and if you've got some particularly special hardware, then you can modify that within the IOC and regenerate. Um, that's all for now.